Hi guys, welcome to the Headphone Show. For today's video, we're gonna talk about the Sennheiser HD 820. This is their flagship closed back dynamic driver over your headphone that comes in right at around $2,400. So let's take a look. Once again, big thank you to headphones.com for making this video possible. I'll leave links to the HD820 below as well as to the community forum where other people are discussing this headphone as well. So check that stuff out. If you guys are new to this channel, we're gonna review this by going over the build quality, design and comfort first. Then we're gonna talk about the technical performance. So that's detail retrieval, speed and dynamics, stage and imaging and timbre. And then we're gonna talk about frequency response and tonality as well as some comparisons and then a conclusion as to whether or not it's worth it. Also, if you guys stick around to the end, I'm gonna give my EQ profile for the HD820 so if you already own one of these and you're wondering how do I EQ this, where should I EQ, uh, stick around for that. But let's begin with build quality, design and comfort. And before we actually talk about that, let's talk first about how terrible this cable is. First of all, what is going on here? This is ridiculous. These connectors are also not particularly good. They are very difficult to pull out. Once you get them in there, they're very secure, which may or may not be a good thing. Uh, but I would have preferred uh, like mini XLR or honestly these days there's so many headphones out there with 3.5 millimeter uh, connectors. This style, this sort of proprietary kind of style is, is not something I'm a huge fan of. And then yeah, the cable tangles and it's way too long. There are other cables in the box as well though and they all kind of have this same uh, style to them, which I'm not a huge fan of. And for build quality, yeah, this is one of the best built and uh, best looking headphones in my opinion. Uh, everything feels very precise on this. Uh, it's got a little bit of uh, swivel here and a little bit of tilt as well. That's really all you need. You don't need it to go all the way around. Um, this is, it's not hard to get this to be comfortable on your head. Uh, and speaking of comfort, when I do wear it, it's wonderfully comfortable. This is one of the most comfortable headphones. It just sort of disappears on my head. The clamp is not too tight or anything like that. It just sort of floats there. It's perfect. The uh, cups are also, uh, the, where the opening is for the ear is also huge. And I feel that these pads are a little bit deeper than what was going on with the HD800 and HD800S, the open back uh, versions of this. Because with this one, uh, I don't find that my ear touches the uh, mesh on the inside at all. Whereas with the HD800S, I found that it touched it a little bit. So uh, very comfortable and easy to wear and get into listening with this headphone. I wanna mention with closing it off, the way that Sennheiser have achieved this is by using concave glass here. And the idea is because the glass is concave, it'll reflect any resonances that hit the back of the cup at an angle rather than directly into the ear. Normally with an open back headphone, they would just go out. But when you close it off, uh, the resonances, you gotta find some way of dealing with the resonances and standing waves and whatnot. So this is an interesting design, but I'm not actually sure that it's any more effective than just using some sort of damping in there to deal with the uh, reflections or any of the uh, sound waves that are produced from the driver going towards the inside of the cup. But in any case, this is using Sennheiser's ring radiator driver. This is 300 ohm, so it's a fairly uh, high impedance headphone. You do wanna run this with an amplifier. It's not super inefficient like a lot of planars are, uh, so you'll be able to run this off of most source gear, but you still want an amplifier for this. You don't wanna run this out of a phone or anything like that. And just for reference, I ran this balanced off of the Kai IHA6 and the SPL Phonator X. I did also try this with the ZMF pendant tube amplifier. It didn't change as much on the solid state ones. So let's talk about technical performance. For internal detail retrieval, so that's detail that's not conferred specifically by frequency response, uh, or at least not immediately noticeable by the general curve, um, the HD820 is excellent. The open back HD800S was a bit of a benchmark there for detail for quite a while, and I think uh, you know, the, what was successful there is successful here as well. So you have excellent structural definition for images, you get a lot of texture coming through, you notice things in tracks where you may not have noticed them before. In my mind, it is a bit of a step down from the HD800S in that department, uh, likely because of the closed back nature here, so it doesn't sound as open, but it's uh, pretty close as far as detail retrieval is concerned. For speed and dynamics, uh, yeah, once again, it's surprisingly tight, but not as tight as with the HD800 and HD800S. And I think a lot of that has to do with the tonality, which we'll talk about. And that's the reason why I don't hear it quite as tight. Uh, and for the slam and impact on the punch, yeah, this also kind of just slaps. Uh, the bass is elevated here and that makes it seem like it's a little bit more punchy and more 
impactful, but uh, this is not like one of those Focal headphones that really hit hard. So I wouldn't say it's a major drawback, but it's also not a major success here either. Uh, for stage and imaging, that is the shining quality of this headphone. The stage, while it is reasonably spacious, it feels like a fairly large and wide stage. Certain elements of the mix are very far forward. And that again, I think has to do with the tonality, which we will talk about, but to be specific, uh, certain vocals come forward in ways that I really find is a bit unnatural. It's a little bit too intimate for vocals while everything else in the mix is placed a little bit further away from me. Uh, but the uh, image separation and distinction and you know being able to isolate individual instrument lines is all fantastic on this headphone. It's one of its best qualities, if not its best quality. Um, so being able to get that sort of surgical precision for the for the images, again, just like with the open back version of this. And then for timbre, there's really not all that much to talk about here. Uh, it's not uh, particularly artificial sounding or metallic, but at the same time, it's not super natural like a you know ZMF headphone or one of those biodynamics either. All right, let's talk about frequency response and tonality because that is the weirdest part about this headphone. In fact, this is one of the most bizarre sounding headphones that I've ever heard. And I think it has to do with the way that they've handled the challenge of closing off the headphone. Uh, there is a base shelf here, so it is elevated in the base considerably more so than the open back counterpart. But then I find that the base shelf there, the elevation, extends a little bit too high up. So it doesn't drop down early enough. It extends all the way past 200 Hertz. And then when it gets to 300 Hertz, it just drops like crazy and it, to me, that has this sort of hollow effect to it. And then it moves up to the mid-range, which is easily the worst part about this headphone. There's a mid-range bump there that is completely unreasonable, and this causes everything to sound a little bit compressed, congested, and a little bit veiled. Uh, and then when you move up into the treble, there's really not that much wrong here. There's no percussion compression issues with 5K Hertz. There is a little bit of a peak there at 6K, but really it's not that bad. Uh, it's not like the original HD 800. And it's also not particularly sibilant, which is really nice. So your S's and F's and T's come across reasonably smoothly. Um, and I have no problems there. Uh, there's not as much air beyond the consonant range. So like, you know, your 10, 11K, 12K, 13K Hertz. Uh, but uh, it's also not bad for percussive instruments. So like drums, cymbals, snare drums, that kind of stuff. Um, the HD820 actually sounds pretty good. Uh, it's really resolving for those instruments, but I find for other types of sounds like vocals or anything with uh, pianos or horns or again, anything that tokens those mid-range frequencies, it's really weird sounding. And I've been struggling to find music that I want to listen to with this headphone just because of how weird it makes everything sound. It's again, that sort of like congested, compressed kind of thing going on with a frequency response. And so this is a headphone where I think not only does it require EQ, it also requires quite a bit of EQ in multiple different places. Uh, enough that it's a bit of a challenge to do, uh, but I will leave my EQ profile here in a little bit. But before getting into the EQ profile, let's talk about some comparisons. The Focal Stelia, so that's uh, around $3,000. It's a little bit more expensive than the HD820. Yeah, that is a better headphone. It is a more, it has a more normal tonality, a more generally agreeable tonality, even though it is a little bit bass elevated there as well. It's also a little bit better on the detail retrieval front and it slams harder. Now the space and stage characteristics of the H HD820 are potentially a little bit better. The instrument separation qualities are a little bit more noticeable because it's on a bigger stage, but I still think that the Stelia has at least as good surgical precision imaging, um, if not a little bit better for those vocals that aren't you know as right front and center in my head like they are with the HD820. The other flagship to consider around this price would be the ZMF Verite Close. Uh, and now I haven't had a chance to review that yet, but I do personally own the ZMF Open, and if the closed is anything like the open, I would take that one over the HD820 every single time. The tonality for those is also not uh, super standard, but it's quite a bit more agreeable than what's going on here. And then I also think that you know some of the closed backs that come in a little bit, uh, you know, at a little bit of a lower price, like the Dan Clark Audio Aeon 2 and the Focal Allegia, I actually prefer those over the HD820. Um, not because they're better at detail retrieval or anything like that, uh, but they do have a more agreeable tonality out of the box, uh, and they are also easier to EQ. You don't have to EQ as much. And then I also find that those ones seal better. So the HD820, while it's a technically a closed back headphone, it doesn't really do that good of a job at isolating sound both in and out. Uh, so when I had this on my test rig, I actually heard the sign sweep that I did on there. 
Um, so that's not a good sign. And then <laughs> that's not a good sign. When I had the HD820 on my head and I wasn't playing music, I could still hear my computer fans a little bit. Whereas with those ones, uh, I couldn't. It isolated it quite a bit better. So for the trade-offs that you end up having here to make it a close back, I don't really know if it's worth it. This isn't quite a close back HD800S as far as the way that it sounds. And then also it's more, it's almost like a semi open back as far as sound leaking in and out. Um, so I don't really think that the overall goal here of closing it off was you know, completely achieved, even though technically it is a close back. But in any case, if you are considering buying one of these or you already own one, I highly recommend doing a bit of EQ and we'll talk about my EQ profile for this next. All right, so what we're looking at here is how the HD820 measures on the mini DSP ears rig using the HPN compensation. And as we can see, it measures particularly poorly. And if anybody's wondering what the heck I'm talking about, check out some of the links in the description below where you can learn all about frequency response measurements, their various different compensations that get used and deviations from the targets and what they mean. Uh, but for the moment, uh, I just want to show you guys this, not because this is what we're going to use to actually do the EQ. I've looked at far more precise measurements for that. The only reason that I'm showing you guys this is because I want to show you the before and after on this same rig uh, for the HDA20, both before the EQ is applied, which is this one here, and after the EQ is applied, which I will show you in a little bit. So let me just bring up the equalizer APO tool that I use, and this is, of course, the piece UI for it, which I highly recommend using, and I'll leave links in the description below for this as well. And... Uh, this is the curve that I ultimately end up applying to it. Now, this looks, again, fairly extreme, but remember that we are using two decibel intervals, so it's not all that extreme. Although, this is a headphone where I do think it requires EQ, and it also requires quite a bit of it. So what are the actual values here? Well, let's take a look at this interface here again. Uh, starting with the bass, we did see that there was quite a bit of a bass shelf, which I don't mind, but I do find that the upper bass does bleed into the mid-range a little bit. So right at around 140 hertz, I've withdrawn that by about 5 dB, and I've used a fairly wide... Uh, Q value here. Now I could have used a shelf filter here instead. Uh, I'm just using the standard peak filter. You can use a shelf filter here if you want to, if you want to bring down all the bass by a certain amount. But I find that, you know, there's a lot of people who really enjoy a lot of sub bass. They want that sub bass shelf to be there. I find that doing it this way instead will keep the bass presence there that you might want and then it makes it a little bit more well-defined so it doesn't bleed into the mid-range the way that the headphone tends to do. Now, the other crazy issue that I have with this headphone is the dip that's around 300 hertz, and that's what causes it to sound a little bit hollow for certain tracks, for certain recordings. And so I do boost this by about 4 dB here. And my feeling is that the dip that exists here for this headphone, which you can see it right here, uh, my feeling is that that is there as a result of closing off the headphone with the concave glass, and then, you know, this is just the place where they had to deal with whatever resonances would have showed up. Now, I don't know if that's actually what's going on here. That's just my suspicion. But in any case, it does kind of ruin the frequency response. Now, you could also elevate this by quite a bit more. Uh, but I don't want to do that because I don't want to risk introducing any uh, unwanted qualities there that aren't there as a result of this dip. So, you know, if it turns out to be the case that the dip there at 300 hertz or 280 hertz or whatever it ends up being is the lesser of two evils, I would rather err on the side of caution <laughs> uh, than you know try and actually get it to where it would measure flat. Uh, use your discretion here, but f you know, in my mind, I think adding a little bit of energy there does still help find the balance for me. And then when we move up into the mid-range, once again, I'll show you how this looks on the chart here. Uh, so this is what I consider to be the most essential thing to EQ on this headphone. If you're not gonna EQ anything else, EQ the mid-range bump between around 700 hertz and 1300 hertz down because the elevation that exists there, let me just pull this up again, this is what causes the congestion that I tend to hear. This is what causes that sort of compressed sound, especially for anything that tokens mid-range frequencies like vocals and pianos, etc. Uh, and when you bring this down to be a little bit more linear and bring it in line with where I think it should be, it makes the biggest difference over everything else. Yes, you can reduce the bass and all the rest of the stuff, but this is probably the most important area for adding a little bit of clarity there and you know making it not as congested sounding. And then as I move up into the treble, I only really elevate you know, 3500, 3600 hertz and 1600 hertz a little bit. Um, I, I don't really think it's as essential to do this. This is more a matter of taste than anything else. There is a bit of a dip there in the frequency response on more accurate rigs, but uh, you know, if you're listening to music with uh, 
electric guitars or anything that might be a little bit shrill there, it's totally fine to have a dip there. I just do this because I like a little bit more clarity there for piano tones and vocals. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do elevate that a little bit. You could go more or less depending on the type of music that you listen to. I don't think it's super essential to do that there. And then I do drop 6K just a little bit. I don't think that the HD820 has as much of an issue with 6K as the original HD800. The original HD800 had quite a bit of a peak there at 6K. Uh, I find that on the HD820, it's it's there, but only just a little bit. So I do reduce that a little bit. I think depending on how sensitive you are to this region uh you know that'll depend on whether or not you you're okay with that being there but for me i'm i'm fine with it for the most part i just like to you know make it a little bit smoother and then you know you can add a little bit of air this is also more a matter of taste than anything else uh you know i think there's very good reason to just leave it uh, at zero and then just you know be happy with the way that the treble sounds because it really does sound good on this headphone everything is balanced for the treble for, for most of the treble above 6k uh, you know it's not particularly sibilant or anything like that it's only if you really wanted to add a little bit more air quality there um, you know then that you, you would need to do this um, which I don't think is all that necessary uh, but in any case this is what I would do as a starting point once again you can be more conservative or you can be more uh, meticulous with your EQ, but I always like to err on the side of caution. This fixes what I consider to be the major issues. And if we look at the frequency response after EQ, this is considerably better. This is quite a bit more normal looking uh, for this rig and for this for the way that this these compensations work on this rig. Yes, you can be more you know meticulous about your EQ. You can drop the bass by a little bit more. But, you know, I personally don't mind where the bass is here. This makes it a little bit more of like, let's say, a classically U-shaped sound, which I think, you know, is a lot of fun for a lot of people. It's a lot more normal sounding than the mess that was this original thing, which, yeah, just did not sound right to me. It sounded both hollow and compressed at the same time. And so, you know, when you do this EQ, then this headphone starts to look a little bit more worthwhile. But that, of course, brings me to my conclusion. Do I recommend the HD820? Well, if you are going to EQ this headphone, then I think, yes, it does start to look fairly interesting. Uh, however, if you're not going to EQ anything, which is like again, probably 90% of you guys, I really think that you would do better getting a closed back headphone that does a better job of doing all the things that closed back headphones are meant for, like sound isolating. Spend less money on that, and then also have an, an open back headphone for those environments where that's possible. Or spend a little bit more money and get the Focal Stelia or the ZMF Verite closed. I think both of those would probably be better options than this one. I do understand that there is a versatility to a closed back headphone that an open back headphone doesn't have. You can use this in far more environments, but then you look at the way that the HD820 performs for those closed back environments, and it's really not quite good enough to justify the price increase from the HD800S. But in any case, that does it for this video. Thanks for taking the time to watch it, and I will see you guys in the next one.